Hello, Kelly. Are Hi, Gio. All- <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see you, Ronnie. It's good to see you. Um, I and am- nice to see everybody on the Zoom. Hello, greetings. This is good. Um, so I get to, um, I have the privilege of asking you some questions and uh, Ronnie's gonna monitor the chat in case I don't cover something that somebody would like me to have asked. But um, I, I have to actually, I gotta go right to the beginning, Kelly, because I wasn't here and I, I've, heard, uh, I've heard stories, but I need to know what was going on in your mind when you said, hey, I'm going to start a theater company, <laughs> that, what, what was the impetus for starting a company back? Uh, well, starvation was threatening and uh, it was a job. So I was pretty excited about that. Uh, I actually had uh, two job offers uh, in the winter of 1970. One was to do uh, an acting class for senior citizens. And the other was to uh, write a new play with uh, young performers, none of whom I'd ever met. Uh, And with due respect to all of us who are now senior citizens, I took the kids and uh, (laughs) off we went. It was, uh, it wasn't a a planned, uh, we, I'd never even heard of the Tony Award and trust me, we weren't thinking we'd get one anytime soon back then. But the idea was to create a new play uh, or musical, whatever it might turn out to be, uh, to be performed in the summer. So on April 1st, we, after doing a little bit of word of mouth advertising, we met with a group of about 35 young performers, uh, writers, all different. It was come, let's make a show. It was really right out of a movie from the 40s, except this was 1970. And... uh, uh, off we went. It was an amazing experience, but uh, the the goal was to do just to do a summer show. As mm-hmm. it turned out, it was a musical. We wrote it ourselves. It was about our community, and uh, uh, it turned out to be uh, a really big hit called Popcorn. Uh, it uh, it also managed to set the fundamental. Uh, ideas of theater works in place, of collaboration, of creating new work, of uh, dealing with issues that were relevant to the community, uh, of diversity where it might never have been seen before, and certainly of the uh, interaction of drama and music. And as it turned out, it also celebrated the human spirit, which seemed like a very new phrase when we thought of it back in 1970. It seems kind of old school right now, but it continues to define theater works. That's amazing. Where, um, where was that one performed? Because you didn't have a home. You didn't have... Well, that was at the uh, Lucy Stern uh, Theater, and uh, we had a two-week run scheduled uh, it seemed like a you know a huge cathedral at the time with 400 seats we had no idea how we'd ever get um, <laughs> people to come or you know anyone to come but as it turned out our show was so, so incredibly relevant to what was happening in the community at the time that we were jam packed from the beginning uh, with a play that was trying to bring uh, generations together under 30 and over 30. And I just looking at the, the crowd that's watching this, I know there's a lot of people who um, remember that world when uh, things were kind of divided between what we thought of as adults and then the rest of us. And uh, off, off we went, our play did bring people together and it brought them together in the audience as well. It was great. That is amazing. I, when, so when you started, who was it just you? How many people were actually running the theater? Well, we were a, a program of the city of Palo Alto, which at the time was running, they ran the theater, the city itself did. Um, 
and we had the just a sort of small task to create one show after it became a big hit um, I mean, there were there were no employees. There was me, um, and that was uh, fifty fifty dollars a week. Uh, that's when we created the catchphrase, uh, the Theater Works uh, logo of the time, which is uh, Theater Works, but it doesn't pay. And uh, <laughs> off we off we went, and we also also started the kind of what a phrase that would kind of haunt me as we gradually became a professional company, which was, uh, what part of full-time didn't you understand? Uh, <laughs> so off we went. But yeah, that, there was, you know, subsequently uh, I got an offer to uh, keep the thing going. Um, and I said, well, that sounds pretty exciting. Um, and uh, the salary was the same. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Having a hit doesn't always guarantee uh, financial success, but uh, it, it at least kept the theater going. And it's at that, that point we came up with our first um, long range plan, which was to do another show. And that became our long range plan for maybe the first decade of Theater Works, uh, which was, let's, let's do it again. That was amazing. That was inspiring. It was celebratory and uh, it, it made a difference. So that was, that's how it worked. That's how we got started. Believe it or not, by the, within two years, we had four full-time employees and uh, all working in that same, what part of full-time didn't you understand concept. Um, and uh, it was pretty, even Stephen in those days, everybody was pulling down the same salary of $50 a week full-time. So, off we went. We made a heck of a lot of theater, and um, and we continue to. It's great. Um, that's the rallying cry of theater in New York. Used to be hold out for minimum wage. <laughs> so, yes. Now, in the beginning, um, you performed all over. Is that is that? We you, did. I used. I walk in the in the Baylands and. Is it true you performed in the, is it the nature? Per, what is that, the structure, the building where you performed? Well, that's called the Baylands Nature Center. And we did, a, we did actually did a, a, quite a few shows there. We did shows everywhere. I mean, a theater, a 400 seat theater wasn't, wasn't really the right size uh, space for us in those days. We would do a show there in the summer, but the rest of them were in smaller spaces all over the area. Um, and the Baylands Nature Center, which held about 60 people, uh, was one that we started using pretty often. Talk about a difficult place to get to. You, you know, we did a production of Macbeth out there in March in the rain, and it, it uh, really did feel like you were in Scotland on the moors by the time you got to the theater. But it was a, it was a wonderful place to perform in an intimate way. The only drawback was, uh, the dressing rooms, which, uh, or the dressing room, I should say, uh, which by day uh, held the Nature Center's collection of uh, snakes and lizards and all of that in, uh, in various tanks. And we just had to put towels over them so the actors could make, get made up without freaking out. Um, and that was, that was the good old days. But we had wonderful productions there, we really did. We performed well, everywhere. We performed at three stories underground at uh, City Hall in Palo Alto for a production of uh, Alice in Wonderland. We actually, it was called Adventures Underground. You came down an elevator three stories under uh, to the very bottom of the uh, uh, parking garage, sat on blankets on the down ramp, and we performed with two lighting instruments and two lighting operators crawling around. Uh, on the concrete trying to light whoever was talking. And I know this very well because I was one of the lighting operators and uh, off we went. You don't usually get that, board op and uh, director, but that was, <laughs> that was it. So we, we, did a, we were in all different kinds of spaces, wonderful spaces all over the place. Pretty, it wasn't long before we started performing in the Fire Circle Outdoor, the what we called the Fire Circle Outdoor Theater. It was uh, part of the Boy Scouts in Palo Alto, a place where they held 
uh, campfires at night during the year. Um, and we, uh, we finally uh, got it arranged so we could get 300 seats into this little place with the, uh, the fire pit uh, usually covered by a platform stage. And we did shows there for 17 years, mostly Shakespeare, and used it in a lot of different ways. We had you know, rope bridges up in the trees. We had a swimming pool that uh, took over from the, uh, uh oh, something's going on. Um, well, I'll keep going. Tom Kelly's screen. Um, I, well, I can see myself, so I think I'll keep chatting. Um, at any rate, uh, you know, we did we did uh, a whole lot of Shakespeare there for 17 years. Uh, finally, the neighbors who were right next door uh, got a little tired of our operation and uh, cited the uh, noise ordinances in Palo Alto. So we were finally shut down and uh, had to abandon it. But we we did have a great deal of success performing in all different kinds of spaces. We'd pick a play and then try to figure out what kind of space would be fun to do it in and uh, away we went. Uh, it was uh, it so was you picked time. the play first. Did you ever did you you pick the play first and tried to make it fit, or did you ever pick a play because you knew you could make it work in the space? Well, usually the the play would come first. Although there were some places where we would repeat things like the Baylands or the Fire Circle, so we knew we had the space, and uh, we would then. Uh, you know, figure out what show we were going to do there. But a lot of shows, we tried to find a space based on, uh, uh, you know, what the, what the script was that we wanted to do. Uh, we did a, a show called uh, uh, Under Milkwood, uh, the Dylan Thomas piece uh, set in Wales uh, and uh, convinced a kind of Welsh British tea room in downtown Palo Alto to let us perform in the middle of their, all their tables and uh, did a production there. So it was, it was exciting. Well, we might be going back to that. So we'll find, we'll, uh, <laughs> and we know who knows how to make that happen. Did Absolutely. You, Kelly, so you, you did lighting, you did, you directed, did you act also? I was an actor. Um, that's sort of what I got started doing at the Palo Alto Children's Theater when I was a kid. And I think that's one of the reasons I've been so supportive of uh, education programs um, in the theater and in the, the world of the arts ever since. Uh, of course, our first production was, a, uh, you know, a basically a class, you know, if you wanted to put it that way. It was a program for youth, uh, and that's how we got started. But um, I acted, I acted in some of our shows over the years, uh, and, uh, like everything in the theater, if you start with one employee, every <laughs> single job is theoretically done by one person. Um, and it didn't take me very long to figure out that, uh, besides putting on another show after the one we just finished, um, the other part of our, uh, long range plan was to gradually find people who actually knew how to do the jobs I was pretending to do uh, for all those years. And that included eventually acting. And we found that there were far better actors out there. Um, and uh, so I, I kind of retired at that point from acting and concentrated on other aspects of the theater. I think the last thing I did was uh, I was the understudy for Lord Capulet in uh, our production of Romeo and Juliet but I was directing so many shows that summer that I really didn't have time to learn the lines. And uh, when I went out for my uh, single performance as an understudy, uh, we barely avoided uh, total disaster. But I did get a good review from um, one member of the cast who said, that's the first time I have ever seen anyone improvise in iambic pentameter. So I, I, I thought I really had, I really cut the mustard at that point. That was the end of my career. Well, I run a little something called the New Works Program, and I might, I'm always looking for actors, so. Uh, I seem to have time on my hands, so. Exactly. If you, uh, 
if anyone shows up with something to do with Romeo and Juliet, I'm pretty ready. You you think so? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go. <laughs> um, all right, I have to ask you, did you ever regret starting a theater on April 1st? And have you, um, what is, has anybody pulled a really good April Fool's joke on you? Um, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, there've been a, there've been a number of surprise uh, parties on April 1st at the offices over the years. And uh, I think that's as close as I've come. And there's been some uh, uh, pretty ex extraordinary decorating that has gone on for April 1st, uh, especially in my office. But uh, we're usually so busy doing things and working uh, in the middle of the winter, early spring that, uh, you know, there kind of isn't time for, for uh, that kind of fun. We're busy having other kinds of fun. Got it. No, no April Fool's shenanigans. I'm sorry. Okay. No, it's because you're surrounded by good people who don't think like that. <laughs> so. Well, yeah. it's great. Thank you for bringing up all the old days. It's really, it's kind of fun for me to, to take my mind back that far uh, and remember what was going on in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, they say, if you remember what was going on in the 70s, you weren't actually there. And there's a certain amount of truth uh, to that. Um, but uh in the 70s and even into the 80s, we were uh, all over the place. Um, yeah, I hope somebody, maybe maybe one of you has bid on our uh, trip. We have a thing that I call the Tour to Theater Works. That's one of our auction items. And uh, it, it involves Ev, my partner Ev, who's right here. I have. Um, going on a tour of all the places we ever performed. Um, well, we probably skip a few, but uh, all over the area and uh, with a whole lot of memories flooding in every time you get to a new place. We try not to visit the snake room at the uh, uh, Bayland Center, but other than that, we, you know, we, we do get out of the car occasionally and uh, take a look at some of our old stomping grounds as it goes along. I'll look for a play that can be done there. I'm in Vegas, I'm in the desert. I think uh, I, can find, <laughs> I can find something. That's grand. So I'm trying to imagine how you started in the 70s, like when, when the theater really changed, when it became, when you knew that it would, uh, could perhaps grow into what it has become, because when, when did that happen? Was that in the 80s or the 90s? That it, you well, really we did a lot of we did a lot of wonderful shows in the '70s, and certainly we had established ourselves uh, with our Fire Circle Shakespeare productions. They were extraordinarily popular. Uh, but I do think the company kind of coalesced uh, in 1980, starting with a production of a Working, a musical called Working, Stephen Schwartz uh, piece. We'd already done Godspell, actually, Stephen has been a big part of the company for years and years. Um, but he had this musical based on Studs Terkel's book. Um, they'd done it with, I think, 15 people or something like that on Broadway. It hadn't really worked. Um, but for us in 1980, uh, we could actually afford uh, more uh, actors than, uh, than we can now. Uh, because the actors were working on that same what part of uh, full-time didn't you understand standard that uh, we'd set back in the 70s. At any rate, we had about uh, 35 or so uh, people in the show of all different ages and certainly all different races and ethnicities. Um, and it, it felt like we had defined the company. I mean, the music was wonderful. What it had to say about real people and the real world, uh, was uh, extraordinary. It seemed uh, totally contemporary. And the people who were in that show became the uh, um, actors in many of our shows throughout the 80s that, that would be featured and would be a big part of it. And also in the early 80s, uh, a wonderful actor and director named Tony Haney uh, joined Theater Works. And uh, he was an African-American performer out of Stanford, uh, who could do just about everything. And he brought immense uh, depth and uh, charm and uh, grace to the company. And eventually that, that decade, 
really did define our commitment to diversity in ways that we'd never even imagined in the 70s. Uh, we started to uh, have actors of all different races in roles that had not been played by anybody other than Caucasian performers in the past, like anywhere on in the world. Uh, and uh, soon became a leader in the Bay Area in the, what was then called non-traditional casting. Uh, and actors, amazing, amazing actors flocked to theater works throughout that decade. And it really did put us on the map in terms of um, becoming a, a Bay Area company rather than a peninsula company, which I think probably is what we, you would say the 70s were. But with Tony as the associate artistic director uh, and a lot of great uh, performers and a board that had now really started to uh, be brilliant and, and kick in and support us in all different kinds of ways as they, as they have continued to do, uh, we grew and grew fast. Um, it, it, some, uh, I just remember a reviewer describing theater works in the summer uh, as like a, a giant city unto itself. Um, and there, because we were doing so many shows, we had so many people everywhere uh, and we're performing in several different spaces at a time with uh, award-winning productions. We started winning awards in the 80s uh, as well. So that was, a, that was definitely a turning point and off we went. We wound up with uh, some remarkable shows that uh, you know people still talk to me about in the lobby and all of that. And I should say I plan to be in the lobby so if any of you are uh, coming to opening night you'll see me there so we can keep the chat going. <laughs> Continue talking about. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, as you can tell, you just plug me in and I talk. So that, that's it. I, I love it. I, I, it's funny, all the questions I've wanted to ask you and just didn't. And now I'm thinking, all right. So I know that um, you've done a few, you've done shows a few times, like you will return to a show, maybe a, a decade will pass. Are there any musicals or plays that you, um, that you would direct differently now, that you really, that you think, oh, I, I didn't understand what that was actually about. And now life has taught me something about that show. Well, that, that happens. Uh, that's one nice thing about uh, hanging on desperately to your job for 50 <laughs> years, that you get to uh, fix your mistakes eventually. Uh, and uh, there've been a couple of shows like that where I felt like we had a great show, but there was something missing and uh, mm -hmm. I, would, I would want to return to it. Um, Cabaret was like that. We had a really great production of it, but it was in the early 70s. There were a lot of things we couldn't do. We staged it in an old firehouse that can be converted into a, uh, like a cabaret. That was great. But when we, when we had a chance to do it uh, a couple decades later with uh, Francis Jew as the MC and in the, the uh, fairly new uh, Mountain View Center for the Performing Arts, we could really turn it into something that felt like a, eventually felt like a rally in, uh, you know, Nuremberg or something. It, it felt like uh, we were right in the midst of this disaster that was happening uh, to the world with the Nazi regime taking over in Germany. And uh, it, uh, it became a stunning, stunning production. Uh, and that, and it gave me a chance to drop a whole lot of things out of the sky, which is one of my favorite things to do. So, you know, we had all kinds of things happening. I think the one that, though, that really stuck in my mind is um, Sunday in the Park with George, mm. which uh, is a very tricky show. There's two parts of it that are, you know, a hundred years apart. And uh, the characters seem to be different. They're related, but they're different. And... Uh, it's very easy for it to seem like two completely different plays, which our first version did. Fortunately, they seemed like two good different plays, but they definitely felt like different. Uh, but when I got a chance to do it again, I, 
I had matured, I guess, is the best word for it. I had, I suddenly saw the, the connections between generations, the way that uh, art manages to uh, find, a, you know, the path downhill and in, in become a bigger and bigger stream as it goes along. And that's, uh, that's how these two worlds connected. And they connected through the kind of soul and spirit of, of characters who uh, passed on their qualities to the next generation and the generation after that. Uh, and being able to use those uh, unifying elements to pull the two halves together uh, created what I thought was a, a really fascinating version of that show. In fact, I, I still remember uh, at the end of it, at the very end of the show, there's a very moving uh, number called Move On. And the whole uh, cast comes in after that uh, to sing the song Sunday. I always bring cards for everyone to opening night and I had a huge stack of cards in my hand standing in the back. Um, and the song was so moving and so overwhelming at the end uh, that I just, I, I really don't know what happened to me or where I went, but when the applause finally ended, I, I was standing in a circle of opening night cards on the floor. It was like a fairy ring of mushrooms. Um, and I just was in tears. I had to pick them up quickly and go hide because the audience was gonna exit and I, I didn't wanna be a basket case uh, in front of everyone, but um, that was a while, while ago, so now I can reveal this uh, moment to everyone here. <laughs> That's the way it was. I don't, um, I don't have a question, but when you talked about your thank you cards, um, that was something uh, I asked Chris Spitzer, who does, uh, he's our props master, what is the thing that Kelly does that you think makes him extraordinary? And he said, it is the thank you cards that you write to every single person who works on a show and the detailed information in them. And I thought that was so beautiful. And it was such a lesson for me because I, this is terrible, everyone. This doesn't leave the Zoom room. But before I met you, I didn't write a thank you card to everyone. I wrote to the designers and the actors. Like I had a list of people and then I just stopped. And I started to think, well, why do I do that? So your um, thank you cards, you, you have now extended the circle of gratitude and grace <laughs> at Theater Works. Well, I have to keep writing things. It's just my nature. I, I like writing. That was, that's what my degree was actually in college. So writing is my thing. Ah, that's, that makes sense. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned your affinity for dropping things from the sky, and I want to know, and that is, I mean, when did that start? When did, because that is your, your petals, your, your leaves, snow, when did that become your thing? Well, I can, I really don't know. It goes back uh, decades and decades. I, I've always... Uh, believed in uh, visual directing that uh, how things look is what it has to say uh, and it, that if it doesn't look right it doesn't say what you're trying to say uh, hmm. and there's something about uh, things that fall in a theater that take you into another place that take you into another world um, it's not a expensive form of theater magic um, uh, although I have been known to stand on top of my car and drop leaves till I found the perfect leaf, uh, to, you know, but um, I do love having things uh, fall and find it in incredibly beautiful. And we've tried a few, a few other things over time. I mean, um, I, did a, I did a show where uh, uh, called uh, Proof, where at the very end, uh, a single feather came floating down out of the sky over a couple who were finding a way to fall in love. Um, and to me, it said exactly that. It was the spirit of a moment that was occurring on stage. 
And that's usually, it's not the, the, oh my God, we have to find a way to drop something. But instead, here's a moment that could be made magical um, with a very, you know, very simple device. It just adds, adds some magic to it. So I guess I'm, uh, I have a wonderful collection of leaves. If you ever want to borrow some, uh, please give me a call, Gio, and uh, we can pass it on to the next uh, generation. We need that. I didn't realize how hard it was to make something fall elegantly and beautifully from the sky until I wanted it to snow in a production. And <laughs> it was either a blizzard or dandruff. It never, it wasn't magical <laughs> ever. And I thought, you make it look so easy. <laughs> it's not, uh, especially snow. That's uh, that's where a lighting designer can really uh, make life wonderful for all of us. In fact, uh, uh, since this is kind of my final uh, interview, I guess as a you know as being an artistic director, I I have to say that I've been incredibly lucky with the brilliant designers who've been part of theater works really from the beginning it's just amazing and there there have been so many um adventures uh, that uh, it's there well we have 440 shows we've done at theater works and in my opinion they've all been brilliantly designed um yeah. and it just makes such a difference when you're a, a visual thinker, I guess is the way I describe myself or as a director, um, that you, you are able to work with others who have, have inevitably have a broader vision than, than you could ever achieve on your own and who can uh, make things look like what they're trying to say. So I, you know, there's too many of them to name everyone, but uh, it has been a, a glory. And continues, uh, you know, really has been a, one of the uh, trademarks of theater works over the years is the brilliant uh, design work in every phase, costumes and lighting and certainly scenery and sound. It, it, uh, it, it isn't just, oh, isn't that cool? It's, oh, I feel what I'm seeing on, I feel it. It comes, it comes at you uh, visually. And uh, that's why I've always loved our design teams. It's uh, something about your shows that I'm always struck by as a director are uh, the, you could take photographs of every scene and understand the story. If you, <laughs> that's if you that's the goal. Image, yeah, it's, it's really truly astounding. Um, because you, how many shows have we done? 400, what? I think there's 440, uh, give or take. Um, That's a few, and I, by that I don't mean there's a couple I'd like to get rid of. Uh, the, <laughs> just the, about 440 of them. I've directed 175, I think, is the. Wow. Uh, so I want to ask you about your favorite production that you ever that you've directed. If you have a favorite, I know we all love our children equally, but tell the truth your favorite. And then um, if there was a meaningful show that someone else directed that surprised you or delighted you, I mean, there are so many to choose from, but I wondered if you uh, would share a few of your favorites with us. Well, my own, uh, <laughs> my own favorites kind of uh, hover around Sondheim's work because it's so rich and wonderful. Uh, Into the Woods is one of my all time favorites. Uh, I think we're the only production that ever decided that the second act needed to be in the winter with snow falling, <laughs> but uh, that was a highlight. Uh, Sunday in the Park with George, I absolutely love. But I've done Pacific Overtures twice, um, which is an honor for any director to do even once. And uh, that remains one of my great, great favorites. It's a kind of mysterious play uh, and musical uh, that really is kind of a, uh, about colonialism and uh, dom you know dominance from one country over another uh, and one culture presuming to dominate over another uh, 
And that, uh, that I think is one of the most uh, powerful shows I've had a chance to work on. Um, and Ragtime. Uh, oh, Ragtime yeah. to me says everything, pretty much everything that Theater Works has ever tried to say in one show. And uh, the opportunity to do it again with great thanks to Tim Bond, our new artistic director, uh, who's uh, asked me to do it in, in coming season. Um, I, get, I really can't wait to bring that show back to Theater Works. It just, uh, it just somehow to me says it all. It, it's the ultimate statement of America, both good and bad. And uh, it, 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 is, it resonates at any time, but it's going to resonate amazingly uh, this next time we do it. As far as uh, works from other uh, directors, um, well, there's Gabe Berry's uh, production of Memphis back in 2004, which was, you know, absolutely fantastic. And uh, uh, I, I had done the uh, first reading of it uh, in our New Works Festival in 2002 and seeing it in 2004 in this uh, glorious, brilliant, uh, absolutely irresistible production um, about prejudice and how it corrupts uh, and, uh, Heart hurts and harms everyone, um, and yet celebrating uh, America's uh, musical heritage of uh, rock and roll, and certainly of the rhythm and blues. Uh, I just loved that show, um, and I loved um, the Four Immigrants, Leslie Martinson's uh, version <laughs> of Kong's piece, um, because it. Uh, as much as I watched it gradually develop, I did not think it could be made into a show that people would love. I thought that people would get it and understand what it had to say, but it, it, it just didn't occur to me that it was a show that people would love. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, I credit that to the directing. Um, and of course, brilliant writing, but, uh, but the directing. And on the drama side of things, um, well, it was a very small show, but it uh, stunned me. And that was your production of The North Pool um, oh. by Rajiv Joseph. You know, I can still feel every moment of that show. Uh, and I read it numerous times before we decided to put it on and as we were working on it uh, and as you guys were working on it um, and it absolutely thrilled me in every possible way uh, it just showed you what drama can do um, and it, and it was a it was so extraordinarily relevant to our times and to issues that were going on in the community at the time that i felt like uh, we had we had landed on exactly the, the precise moment in time for that play with the precise, beautiful, dramatic production. Um, but when you have 440 to choose from, step back, I could go on for days, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to, to look in the chat to see other people's uh, favorites because people were writing down their productions. And, well, you talked about Memphis and North Pool and um, Four Immigrants and all these new works. And one of the things that um, I didn't want to slide by was you didn't know what Four Immigrants would be, and yet you still were a champion of that. And I think that's extraordinary. So when did, when, I mean, I guess because of popcorn, new works were always important to you, but when did really creating uh, the program that I run, um, which is, you know, I, I love, I love it. And it's, it's we're I'm the risk, everyone. I'm the, <laughs> I'm the, the I'm the risk and reward ratio often. And I, I just love that you are such a champion of new works. And how did that love of start? Well, I, uh... Our first three years, I think we did almost entirely new works uh, at, 
that theater was. Part of that was philosophical. A small part of it was budget driven because uh, we couldn't afford to do anything except the things we wrote ourselves. Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, that was it, writing your own piece about things that you cared deeply about was um, seemed much more important than uh, being part of uh, somebody else's play or what have you. And that spirit uh, continued uh, for quite a while, for you know, 30 years we did, and we did a lot of different new works, but nothing like we have done over the last 20 years. In about 2000, uh, I started feeling like we had lost the fire that we had started with, uh, the fire for creating new things. Um, uh, we, we needed to uh, change that and see if we could recommit the company to mm -hmm. new works uh, uh, in a very profound and, and deep way. We did a bunch of surveys of people in the area, of writers and so on, and eventually came up with our new works initiative it was going to be expensive at a time when we didn't have much money to to spend and it would mean new positions including the one is yours uh, but our board of directors we've just been so lucky we've had this wonderful wonderful boards of directors and they uh, stepped up and said this is important this is going to make a difference this could change the company for all time and uh, with their support, uh, we got started. Kent Nicholson was our first New Works director. And our first uh, festival was in 2002. I thought it would be about five years before we were able to actually produce anything. It's like growing a fruit tree or something. And uh, we had to see what would happen. Uh, but our first festival had uh, two shows in it out of four that wound up on the main stage in 2004. Uh, one was Memphis, and uh, I mean, who knew? There it was, this incredible gem that would go on to change everything for theater works um, as we move forward. Um, the other one was My Antonia, and it was an adaptation of Willa Cather's novel by, uh, done by Scott Schwartz, who was this young up-and-coming director who called me before the festival and said, can I bring uh, somebody along to write music? And I said, well, I don't think we can afford that. We can just find some music for him. He said, oh, no, no, it, it's not gonna cost anything. I'm gonna ask my dad. And his dad, Stephen Schwartz came and that was just fine with us. Uh, and he wrote this incredible score for my Antonia, a full score. I wish it was being performed in symphony orchestra somewhere because it was incredible. Um, and that was in 2004 as well. And because of Memphis and all the things that happened with it, we don't talk about it that much, but that was our first world premiere by Stephen Schwartz uh, and directed by Scott. Scott was the, co was the writer of it. Um, and that relationship that started with the New Works Festival would eventually lead uh, first of all, to Memphis winning the Tony in 2010, but also to Scott and Stephen giving us a call in 2017 and saying, we've got a, another show, um, and um, how do you feel about doing it? And thanks to friends at Universal Studios and our wonderful support here at, uh, in the Silicon Valley, that show was possible, so much bigger than what we could really normally do. Um, but the, you know, the energy, the commitment and the knowledge of each other as artists and as an artistic producing organization between Stephen and Scott and Theater Works and uh, Phil Santora, who, you know, made this whole thing happen for us. Uh, it was, uh, it was another miracle. And I really do think that it, it wasn't just Memphis, but this whole slew of new works that uh, first Kent helped us find and create, then Meredith McDonough, who did a beautiful job and brought you to Theater Works um, for various new works things and all of that. Um, and finally, uh, the brilliance of your time here, creating new things for us and finding new things. Um, this is what 
this is what has put theater on the map. You can drop a lot of leaves out of the air, uh, which is my specialty, but getting these works that are important to the American theater can lead you to even greater things. Um, and I wish I had it to hold up. Um, just pretend that this bottle of J. Lore is the Tony Award, and this is what it looks like. Um, so thanks to you, Gio, and to everyone who's made new work so special here at Theater Works. Um, you are you are gracious and humble, and uh, we're not going to let you get away with that for too long. But I, <laughs> you're talking about all that. And I was thinking, you know, I was you know perusing the auction items and looking at the fact that Stephen Schwartz and David Henry Huang made doodles, like just I know. Yeah, who? Who's Isn't that, that great? Right? That's insane. <laughs> I wish I had one of these. They're just so great, so cool. Um, our house is, uh, you're looking at most of it right now. It's 560 square feet total. And uh, we don't have wall space for uh, doodles by uh, the greats of American theater. But the, I mean, the, these two, these guys are the greats. They are the essence of American theater. Stephen Schwartz, I mean, I mean please. He's, he's the king. And well, they, uh, David Henry Wong, who is uh, the chair of the, the American Theater Wing, which puts on the Tony Awards, besides writing God knows how many brilliant shows. We've done several of his shows at Theater Works, which is why he likes us, um, <laughs> and uh, has come to be uh, MC at several of our uh, galas. I mean, David is one of the great dramatists of our era. Um, and who knew he could doodle? I'm really impressed, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. But uh, I'm, I'm sure they're gonna go to good homes of people who love uh, theater uh, and especially have an appreciation of uh, the national theater world because these guys are, they're, they're great friends with theater works but they are certainly among our greatest artists. You. So since your home is uh, small, as you said, I'm sure you kept a treasure. Did you, is there something that you kept um, that you did not? Offer? Well, you, uh, you know, you told me you were going to ask me that. Uh, I had I to clean up my office and a lot of treasures wound up in our auction. Um, and uh, much of this, the selection process had to do with uh, how much you could actually take home from 50 years of work. Uh, <laughs> and uh, find shelf space for and all of that. But I did, there were a couple of things I couldn't part with. There were things I didn't want to part with, but uh, I did. Um, but yeah, uh, Pacific Overtures had, uh, you know, was set in Japan in the 19th century um, before it was opened up uh, to the West. And uh, I've, uh, this is one thing I brought home, uh. this guy. It's one of the most beautiful props we ever had at theater. It's a mask, um, and uh, and it was an old man. Um, and even though the cast was huge, we couldn't afford an old man. So here's the mask. And uh, uh, looking around the Zoom room, I see that uh, several of you uh, would have eagerly volunteered. But nevertheless, this is how we did it. And it was, uh, you know, it was wonderful. So I had to keep that. But on the other end of the spectrum, one of the things that I love most uh, in the theater is the opportunity to work with young performers. Uh, it doesn't, you know, they're very expensive to do because of all the schooling issues you have to deal with. Um, but uh, it's been a big part of theater works all along and something that I dearly love to do, uh, to open their eyes to what the potential is uh, uh, as an art, uh, being an artist and getting a chance to work with people who've made careers in the arts um, and to, to display the brilliance of, uh, you know, people as young as 10 or 11. Um, we did a show, we've done a lot of shows like that that I've been part of. Uh, one of the most recent ones was Tuck Everlasting, which centers on an 11 year old a girl, and we had two wonderful, wonderful young actresses uh, 
playing Winnie Foster, um, who sort of follows a frog, an actual frog out from her house into the woods and eventually discovers a spring that, get, that offers you uh, universal life forever. And in the, uh, in the play, she has to choose between having a regular life, a real life, you know, a child and all of that and going through life as we know it or living forever. It's a, it's a remarkable piece for young people. Um, and one of the songs that's most significant in it is called Time, sung by a, a, a character who has been exposed to this spring of life-giving water and will never die. And it says nothing but time. Uh, but in some ways, having all the time in the world isn't enough if you can't find a real life. So on opening night, Natalie uh, Schroeder, who was one of our two young actresses playing that, gave me this little clock right here. Um, and it, that did it. I started crying immediately. Um, but then when I looked down at the bottom of it, there's a frog right down at the bottom of this crazy little kitschy clock. <laughs> gotta keep it forever forever that is amazing and she will be honored <laughs> <laughs> um oh kelly we have reached i believe ronnie is it true we have reached the moment of our toast so everyone um if you have your J lore like i do or your very inappropriate glass that says, cheers, bitches. I'm gonna turn that around. <laughs> so um, we, I have a toast for you, Kelly. Um, so, all right, is everyone ready? I'm looking in the windows, we all have our toast, okay. To make a living in this business is already quite an accomplishment. To make a life in the theater is a remarkable feat. You, Kelly, not only did that, but with your incredible imagination and your huge heart, you created a home where thousands of people have been able to thrive and have a life in the theater. For over 50 years now, you have invited this community to come together to celebrate that which makes us extraordinary. You have enriched our hearts, our minds, and our spirits. You have dropped magic from the sky and filled our hearts with song. You have always believed in the best of us and so we have grown brighter and better for having had you guide us. As Sondheim said, an exit from one place is an entrance to another. So as this community has been made richer by the treasures you have given us, it is with profound admiration and deep love that we raise a glass to you and send you on your next adventure. Here's to you, Kelly. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> hey. Thank you so much. How exciting. And thanks to everyone who's uh, signed on to our Zoom. Who knew we would Zoom this, but uh, here we are the Zoom generation, uh, gen generation Zoom, I guess is who we all are now. It goes for days and days and weeks and months and years. And let's hope this goes a very short time and we'll be back to being who we really wanna be and uh, have been. At any rate, it's, uh, it's been an honor, everyone. It has been such an honor being part of this company, being part of all of you um, and knowing all of you. And uh, trust me, these are relationships I intend to keep strong for years to come. So nice to see everybody. And uh, here's to you, everyone. I better Thank drink, you. don't you think? Yeah. yeah. Okay, here you go. <laughs> Thank you. Mm, J. Lord, yeah. <laughs>